Welcome to Health and Veritas. I'm Harlan Krumholtz. And I'm Howie Foreman. We are physicians and professors at Yale University. We're trying to get closer to the truth about health and health care. So Harlan, we're about to have a conversation with Elizabeth Bradley, the 11th president of Vassar College, and our friend and colleague who's been a leader in global health. Um, but before we get to that, what's something in health news that's got your attention this week? Something that caught my attention this week was an article that was published in JAMA Network Open on the topic of surgeon proficiency and its effect on patient outcomes. Now, this is something that's interested me for a long time. I, what we would like to happen is for surgeons to be like pilots. That is, you assume a certain level of competency. You don't have to vet them. You don't have to ask people, which flight should I take? You know, who are the pilots? Let me see what their record is. How many flights have they taken? How did they do on the simulator? We, we, we assume the industry takes care of this. So when we get on a plane, we've got a team, not just a surgeon, but a team that can actually get us to where we're going, go safely. And, and we, we, have, we don't even have the cognitive load of having to worry about this. But in healthcare, what's the normal thing that happens? I need a procedure, and somebody says, who's good? And of course, nobody knows for sure. And then there's this big question of how much variability is there? So in this paper that was published out of the University of Michigan, a really good academic center, they looked particularly at, at surgeons who were reattaching digits. Now, I know this sounds gruesome. Maybe we're on the cusp of of, of, thanks, of uh, Halloween, so th this may be appropriate. But, you know, unfortunately, from time to time, someone that sustains an injury and actually a digit gets separated from their body. And the truth is sur good surgeons can reattach them. But what they did was they looked at all the, the digits that had been reattached over about a decade, and they looked closely at the surgeons and and came up with a novel score of their proficiency. And they looked at sort of the first half of the decade. And then they said, now, based on what we know of how good they are, does that actually hang true for the next half, for the ones that they did next? And they could see that there were marked differences in the success of the surgeons and marked differences among all the surgeons. And and that was highly correlated. That is, the surgeons who were good in the beginning were good in the end. And and so it made a difference who your surgeon was. And, and I found this very disturbing because I've been pushing the idea of team-based care, the notion that, that the results are really the, the basis of how everyone works together. And in this study, disturbingly, it, it made a big difference. The success rates were very different between the better surgeons and the surgeons that were not as good. It is a challenge when you think about commoditization in medicine. On the one hand, we would love to think that we're sufficiently um, equal among each other that everything we do is high quality and it shouldn't matter who you go to. On the other hand, we know factually that's not the case and you've just given another example of that. This is building on a theme of studies that came out of the University of Michigan just to say there was another set of studies that were done earlier where they actually filmed people doing bariatric surgery. And they could see the difference between people who had very smooth movements versus people who had jerky movements and actually got worse outcomes. And again, you know, we're, if we're going to start to realize that, then we need to feel like, how can we get everybody so there's a, a narrow range of top performance, not a big range where it just happens to be who you got may importantly determine how you do. That's just unacceptable. How about you? What's on your, what did you see this week? Yeah, I sort of uh, have been thinking a lot about global vaccine equity um, over time. And today I saw in the news, which which gave me a little comfort that the Biden administration is allowing Moderna to basically take 20 million doses that were due to be delivered to the United States earlier and deliver them to Africa uh, and deliver them to areas that are vastly under vaccinated. And they're able to do that because quite frankly, we're not vaccinating enough in this country. And so there are leftover doses. But the reason why it gave me comfort is that too many people have been saying to me that, well, if we don't use them, they're just being wasted. They're being discarded. And that never made sense to me because the manufacturers can direct vaccines to where the need is at any given moment in time. And the only way they should be discarded is if we're over ordering them to the point of care. Uh, and this is a good example that we're not doing that, that there are doses available. And if we're not using them fast enough in the United States, we can release some of those to other countries that need them uh, more acutely. And, you know, speaking of, of global health, we have one of the world's great global health experts just about to join us. Yes. Howie, I'm excited today because we are having one of my most favorite people in the world 
join us for a session. Well, it happens to be Betsy Bradley, Elizabeth Bradley, the president of Vassar, the 11th president of Vassar, and a spectacular researcher, policymaker, advocate, and now president, hospital administrator. I mean, she has done everything over the course of her career, including leading Branford College while she was at Yale and having a dramatic influence on the course of my own research and the kind of impact that I was able to have in cardiovascular disease. I couldn't done a, a fraction of what I was able to accomplish without collaborating with, with Betsy. So we're, we're very fortunate to have her. She steered the institution through some very challenging times throughout COVID. So this is a chance for us to talk to her and, and get some of her perspectives on, on where we've been and where we're going. Yeah, no, this is really exciting to have you here, Betsy. Uh, as I've known Betsy for the same 25 years uh, since she finished the PhD. I think we both came on the faculty at the same time. It's an honor and privilege to have her here. Uh, we also share students at this point, and I've gotten used to the fact that we're supposed to refer to her as President Bradley from here on. So, so President Bradley, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. And I think you know my first question for you is uh, t- tell us what it's been like leading a major you know, liberal arts college during a time of pandemic uh, as a global health expert. Thanks, Howie. But before I address that, I have to really just thank How- Howie and Harlan. Um, those are really kind words that you said, but I just need to tell the truth about this. I would be nowhere <laughs> without the two of these people. <laughs> Uh, so many times I can remember sitting down with Harlan and him preparing me for an interview, um, you know, to get a grant. And he just basically taught me how to present. And I think of some oh, of those on. pearls of wisdom <laughs> my whole time. And Howie, Howie got Vassar through this pandemic with me. I invited Howie at least three times up to campus. And now our faculty keep saying, can't we start a medical school so we can employ Howie? <laughs> but, you know, we haven't been able to do that. So getting through the pandemic, well, it... Um, First of all, it has been a 24 seven job. It's really just been a way of life. And I think so many of us in the public health and medical field feel this way. You're just never not thinking about COVID. And when you're responsible for a liberal arts college where you have 2,500 students living on the campus, 300, 350 faculty coming and going, another 1,200, 1,400 employees, any um, potential for outbreak is just very chilling and very scary. So um, the, so what it was like to get through it is just the biggest stretch I've ever had to do in my life. And I do feel like I have, as Harlan said, done a lot of different things across a lot of different countries, but um, when ultimately you're responsible for people's lives from a systems point of view, um, yeah, it was really a big stretch, but also thrilling and I guess I don't know, one of the most thrilling things is to see how the culture shifted during this time. You know, we were very focused on having everybody here. As you said, it's a residential program. Being face-to-face was important, and we have been that from the beginning. Well, you know, I I think there there can't have been anyone who was more qualified than you to lead at a time like this. I mean, just, and this is speaking truth, you know, with your global health background, with, with your deep roots in public health and your education around administration and what what do you think that you were able to bring to this and and do you think that background helped a lot or I mean what yeah. you know how did you think about it I mean my background really did help a ton um, I'll start with the background in public health I mean just like both of you I could read the scientific literature I could challenge some of the papers being written to say wait 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 is that right and I, I could sort of use my own methodologic background to pitch different ideas that might work, et cetera. So comfort with the scientific literature was a big thing that helped. Um, I think also my board was tremendously supportive of us because they knew I had a public health background. That doesn't necessarily mean anybody in public health knew more what to do than anybody else because none of us have been through a, a pandemic like this before. But I think I got more sort of confidence. And then I got put on uh, Cuomo's reopening committee for New York State because of my background and so was intimately involved in writing the guidelines for higher ed coming back. And that helped a lot too. I'd, I'd get early information and then um, would be relied upon about, okay, how could we actually bring higher ed back? 
The management side's been incredibly important too, and I must say, I never thought I'd be a hospital administrator again, but there were times that I would walk in the morning and I'd say, oh my gosh, this is exactly like being a hospital administrator. We need a bed management program. We transfer people to different parts of the college. It really, um, all of that came back. And you know, the greatest wisdom I got from management, and so much of this work was with you, um, Harlan and Howie, um, was at the end of the day, you're championing a vision, an idea, but which is at the top, you've you got the big vision, but you're getting nowhere unless you have the front line completely sold and in fact, um, m get the momentum going at the front line. So we worked a lot on how to do that. Yeah, I, I will say like, you've taught me a lot about leadership uh, over the last few decades and uh, you have been a true leader during this time because it does require bringing together uh, all the different stakeholders, both in the community, within the college, the students, the staff, the faculty. I experienced a little of this speaking to your various groups. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to know what, what um, attributes do you think you drew upon the most uh, from your personal experience that helped you do be so successful because quite frankly as an outsider you were extremely successful at, at having um, a agreement among all these groups and, and a, a singular focus. And the parents, don't forget the yeah. parents, I'm sure you were getting tons oh of calls. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. Tons. Including our tons. colleagues, including colleagues. <laughs> exactly, exactly. People that we both, all three of us know very well. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know about the attributes, Howie, but I do know about some of the sort of strategies that we used. And I will say one of the most important was setting our values at the very beginning. I remember sitting in this office with our whole senior team and we were flailing like everybody was. What are we gonna do, what are we gonna do? Um, and we said, okay, job one, we have to set our values. And after that, we'll know what to do better. And so we set them from the beginning and I put them on a big sticky on my wall in the office, et cetera, and then later on Zoom. But the first was to protect our most vulnerable, no matter what. We had to create a system that our most vulnerable people, we were not gonna have any deaths, we were not gonna have any train wrecks, we were gonna protect them. And that was financially vulnerable people too, so that led immediately to we will not have layoffs no matter what. Um, and our second value, which is very Vassar, was equity. We were going to try to um, implement things in an equitable whole of college. So if we had to take cuts, everybody was going to do it, from the chair of economics, which is sort of like the cardiac surgeon, to um, you know another field that's um, less well-paid, et cetera. And our third value was our mission. We wanted to continue to give the highest quality liberal arts education you could in an inclusive setting. So that means you've got to be on campus. Setting those values at the beginning and keep talking about them every, every time I was in front of the faculty or any of the employees was super important. Um, the other thing that we did is we created a group called Vassar Together, made up of um, our union staff, our administrators, our students, and our faculty, who was in charge of taking what the senior team said was the vision and was the general framework and telling us how to implement it. Like, what does that mean that we're going to have a campus that everyone's got to stay on the campus like an island, like the New Zealand of higher ed? What does, how are we going to do that? I didn't figure that out. We gave it to the front line and said, okay, we've got to keep the students on campus. How are we going to do that? And they came up with really great social norms and ways to support people doing that that were non-carceral, non-punitive. And I probably wouldn't have thought of all those things, but they did. So I think, I guess the second thing is trusting that you just have to set the, the basic bar and then trusting people that they will come up with better ideas. The last, and this is an attribute, I, we just communicated constantly. Every two weeks we had an all college forum on Zoom and really most of the college came webinar and an hour. I would give 20 minutes of comments and then say, what, do you, what are your questions? And it was just you know, exhausting because um, you get kind of repetitive, but I learned so much through those. What people asked me, I'd be like, okay, we gotta really think about that now, that's a priority. So, you know, I guess those are some of the ways that we got through it. I had a tiny taste of that when I spoke to your to your uh, faculty and staff, um, and I will say you, you are remarkably transparent. You would say to me in advance, "Here are the types of questions they might ask you," and you know, as long as you're comfortable, answer anything you can. It was never like 
tell them only the good stuff. It was really powerful. So I appreciate that. So, so what's it like now? I mean, are, do you feel you're still in it or have you now reached a point of equilibrium about how people act and what, what do you see as happening in this moment? And what do you think is going to be in January? I mean, if, if the variants and so forth don't change, but we're sort of like where we are now. Well, the truth is I've been surprised at how hard this year is compared to last year. You know, last year you could rev people up to be uh, urgent and like, we are in a pandemic, people get on your mask. What, you know, you could sort of get people um, to take it really seriously. This year, I kind of want to calm people down. We are 100% vaccinated. We are just testing all our students because it was um, past, uh, we've been away for a week, and I think we've tested thousands really, and we're getting maybe five, six cases. I mean, we are just really okay. But to have people take a breath and stop being so scared, that's actually a fear I have, is how are we going to revert to the normal risks of normal life and not be sort of overreacting? And often when we overreact, um, there are unintended consequences. Like I'm thinking of this one debate we had this morning about when we have a lecturer come to campus, if they're six feet away and, and vaccinated and they're giving a lecture to 200 people, all vaccinated and all in masks, can that lecturer reduce their mask? Can they take it off? And I mean, of course they can from a public health standpoint, but the faculty, the students, you know, people are like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, we're so used to constantly having a mask. So how to calibrate risk tolerance. Um, it's much harder this year than last year, much more subtle, I think. Um, I do think that going forward in the spring, and this will be our biggest challenge, how do we get back to not having a mask inside? I mean, that's what we're really working on. How do we do that in a safe way? We just can't keep masking on the inside. It changes people's mental health. It changes how we socialize. It changes how we learn, particularly languages. And I mean, you both know this. So that's what we're really um, kind of shooting for. And you know, we're getting everybody boosters soon. I, I think we're gonna get there. Um, that's my dream. But you're the physicians, you tell me. Yeah, look, I think it's challenging. And I will say um, our, our School of Public Health has taken a position to wear masks uh, when you're lecturing. Uh, the rest of Yale University makes it optional. And for me personally, I've decided to just test on Mondays and Wednesdays so I can take the mask off Tuesdays and Thursdays without feeling like I'm in conflict. But there's no perfect way to do this. It's all about mitigation uh, and all about trying to balance the interests of everybody. So I, I agree with you. It's not easy. And it's great to hear that you're working toward trying to remove masks in most situations. Uh, going forward. I'm curious because you said you have 100% vaccination on campus. That's an enormous accomplishment and very few places have gotten to that. Can you speak a little bit about how difficult that might have been or why it was so successful? Yeah. Yeah, it was really hard among the employees because we have four unions and although the unions cooperated and we cooperated with them very well, it took time for us to go through the science a lot, to really sit down again and again and say, this is really where we have to get to. So we didn't have the agreement from all four unions until about three days before school started. And then we gave some um, bleed in time. So that took a while. We do have medical and religious exemptions, um, very, very small, like less than 2% of the population has a religious or medical exemption. Everybody else is vaccinated. I think for the students, it was easy. We really, they just all wanted to be vaccinated. The employees, it was harder. Um, and again, I think it was the relationship with the unions. Also, and this ties to just another point, I think I'm hoping to pull out of last year and keep with Vassar forever. We really worked at this whole of campus response and the moral underpinning of it was this motto and how you probably heard it when you were here, but we precedes me which is not that easy for 18 to 22 year olds to think about that the community is more important than what I want. And when we were pitching the vaccination, that's what we were saying, like you might not wanna be vaccinated, but this community can work a lot better together if you're vaccinated and you know, that's a value we have, we precedes me. And you know, people bought into that and it's small enough and um, close enough physically that we could actually make that work. And I, I hope it'll stick because I think the more people recognize and accept their interdependence, the healthier we'll be over the long term. 
So you have deep experience in strategy and, and, you know, in the United States and across the world, of course, having worked with Tedros very closely in Ethiopia and, and, and you see what's going on in, in the country. If you were in a position, political position in this country right now, and you're giving advice to the administration about how to bridge this hesitancy and, and the fact that our nation is fragmenting into more of me than we, uh, what are your thoughts about what we should be doing or how we should be doing things differently? Tough question. I really do not have the answers, but I'll give it my best guess. I mean, you asked what I would do. So what I would do is take advantage of what Americans are really good at. We're super good at innovation and we're super good at local activism, local movements. And even when we look at the top performing um, you know, areas of the country, it's usually a county or a hospital. So I think we have to work locally at this as well. And what we haven't done enough is create a latticework of local um, leadership. And that can be from any sector, medicine, religion, you know, social services that start to work with their own constituents about, okay, vaccination and scientific literacy. I think if we constantly try to do it from the top down, even at the state level, it's too high. I think the, um, the investments have to be made very locally. And when I think of what has happened at Vassar, and again, we're still in the middle of it, so I do not, I don't have so much hubris, like I wanna stay humble here. Um, I think the fact it's really a local institution has helped us a lot. Um, so we got, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000 people we have to take care of. So if the country is split into aliquots of 5,000 people with some leadership, um, you know, I think we have really potential with that. Um, but top-down things, I don't think we do as well. Yeah, I'll just say one quick thing about that, that, you know, I, I felt that from the beginning that it's, a, it's the in-group, not out-of-group that where the influence comes from. And even with the issues in Florida, you know, the federal government just can't come in as, you know, strong arm people. What it needs to do is to tell people when you're ready, we're ready. We will help you at any time. We'll make sure anyone who wants a vaccine, will can get it. You guys have to work this out locally because it, it just is too hard on the federal level. I, I, I know there's counters to that, which is there's a responsibility federally, but it just uh, in some ways, that push created an even stronger resistance. And and I think what you just said is exactly right. The federal framework has to be enabling, has to set the framework, um, the governance structure, so it's there if you are ready. But, you know, at the end of the day, we are a local people. We, we are individualistic and independent, and that's what we, and that benefits us because people will move when they want to move. But we have to step back and, I think, um, rely on those more local structures. I know we don't have much more time, so I want to ask one last question, and that is, you know, everybody you talk to say there are some silver linings from this pandemic and lessons to be learned that can help inform the future. I'm curious to know, are, are there any one or two things that you think about that that Vassar gained that will be, that help, help com, you know, propel them into the next decade and so? We learned a lot, honestly. I, first of all, I think starting with we precedes me, that's, that's kind of in our blood now. We're, we're gonna keep that and do our best going forward and what better thing to grow up with when you're 18 to 22 and hopefully replicate when you graduate and go into the larger globe of what one wants to do. So that's key. Technologically, it's like we went forward 10 years. You know, every faculty member knows how to teach online. Um, we know how to have meetings online. I mean, our classrooms are now equipped technologically. Um, we're much more, we're just so far ahead of where we would have been. The last thing we really learned is how to be in community with Poughkeepsie and our Dutchess County because I worked really closely with our public health agencies here and our faculty did too. And I think going forward, a lot of those pathways between the college and our larger community are much better worn now. And I hope we'll continue to benefit from each other's assets and understandings. Yeah, I just want to thank you for taking the time. It, 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 it great work, no surprise, but really great work. So nice to talk to both of you. And you know, you are invited to Poughkeepsie anytime, <laughs> hour and a half from New Haven, right up the train line, um, and we'll, we'll treat you well up here. So thank you so much, Howie and Harlan. Thank you so much, President Bradley. <laughs> Thank you, President Bradley. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Take care. Harlan, what's one thing that inspires you or keeps you up at night? This is kind of something that's keeping me up at night. You, you know, I love NIH, and I think 
Francis Collins walks on water, Tony Fauci, the same thing. But, you know, there's this weird thing going on where the NIH sent a letter to members of the House Committee on Energy and Commerce that, that talked about a grant that they had given to an organization called Echo Health Alliance, a New York City-based nonprofit that, that works with laboratories around the world. And it turned out that this, this organization had been working with that, that lab in, in Wuhan and, in fact, was working on bat coronavirus. In fact, we're working with putting a gene into mice that has this ACE2 receptor. You know, that's the receptor that we all carry, humans carry, that the coronavirus links into and has been, do in fact, did some work where they found that with some manipulation, actually, that the virus became uh, more aggressive, you know, more pathogenic. And, and for a while, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty about these grants and what were they? What are they doing with China? What, how, what's this ECHO Alliance? And now they're coming out with this letter saying, on one hand, there's no way this has anything to do with the pandemic. On the other hand, we want to disclose that ECHO Alliance was behind in, in reporting what was going on with the grant. We would have had a higher level of scrutiny if we knew that the one of the experiments was leading to a situation where, where the virus had become more pathogenic. And, and I just find it all confusing. I'm not making any conclusion about it, but it just seems like it took a while for this to get out. And then then a guy, uh, one of a Stanford microbiologist, David Relman, he, you may know him. He's a very well-regarded scientist. His father was New England Journal of Medicine editor. And, and he was asked about this. And he's, he said, you know, given all the sensitivity about this work, it, it's difficult to understand why NIH and Echo Health have still not explained a number of the irregularities with the reporting of the grant. And and he goes on to say it's another uh, chapter in a sad tale of inadequate oversight, disregard of risk, and insensitivity to the importance of transparency. And I, I'm looking at this, and I know Relman, and, and I'm thinking about how all this fits together. And yeah, this is something on my mind. I think there will be more to come on this. I think it's not not done yet. And it is a question of, of is this just a true, true, and unrelated? But it just seems weird that the U.S. was funding research in that Wuhan lab around bat coronavirus and 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 ACE2 receptors. I don't know. Yeah, it, it really, um, you know, reminds me just how important transparency is and how important journalists are for digging into areas that may be opaque to the rest of us. Uh, the topic I wanted to talk about this week is somewhat related to that in the sense that, you know, our colleague and friend Eric Topol uh, from the Scripps Institute tweeted out yesterday about uh, um, a paper that sort of summarized the evidence in ivermectin, but looking at it through a lens of, you know, bias and fraud, you know, trying to minimize, when you're looking at a meta-analysis of the evidence in I ivermectin, starting to minimize uh, those papers that have a, a significant amount of bias built into them and obviously excluding those papers that have now been found to be fraudulent. And it just changes completely our, uh, you know, apparent equivocation about ivermectin to basically showing that there's no compelling evidence that shows that it works. And, you know, his point and other people's points, and you have said this to me many times, is we just need to document every clinical trial. Like, it, it, it is no longer acceptable to have some clinical trials moving on to publication and some clinical trials, perhaps with negative results, not moving on to publication, because when you do these types of meta-analyses, it will bias the ultimate results uh, from them. So again, in that theme that you've talked about, transparency, in my opinion, is only a good thing, and more interrogation of that data is always a better thing. Oh, this is more than transparency, in my view. I mean, this is really scientific misconduct. I mean, people running experiments on human beings and not sharing the results, it, it, it ends up corrupting the entire medical literature. It leads you to concerns that that many of the trials, particularly ones that didn't go the way the investigator wanted, never see light of day. And so when people combine them and then say, like, this is the world's literature on this topic, and yet a large amount of evidence is missing, missing, hidden away. No one can find it or see it. Uh, you know, the truth is you can't draw any reasonable inferences from the data. And, and as you said, I've written about this a lot. I've talked about it in many venues and believe that this is something that we should take very seriously. If you do not publish your results, you should not be eligible to get federal grants. You should be suspended within your institution if you conducted experiments on human beings for which you registered studies and you did not share what you found. And yet, 
institutions do not take this seriously enough. You've been listening to Health and Veritas with Harlan Krumholtz and Howie Foreman. So how did we do? To give us your feedback or to keep the conversation going, you can find us on Twitter. I'm at at HMK Yale, H-M-K-Y-A-L-E. And I'm at the Howie. That's at T-H-E-H-O-W-I-E. Health and Veritas is produced with the Yale School of Management. Thanks to our researcher, Sherry Wang, and to our producer, Blank Eskin, of Noun and Verb Rodeo. Talk to you soon, Howie. Thanks very much, Harlan. Talk to you soon.